sisters in Christ, especially those in the virtual worship space, and our visit visiting friends. We continue the series on eschatology with a look on the resurrection. I want to express to your leadership great appreciation for always inviting me to share in these interesting topics. I believe that uh, this series of presentation is on a subject that is most important, especially considering the context of the time that we're living in. I believe this subject will revive hope and peace in our hearts if we receive the messages well. Now, this morning we're doing an introductory exercise to the, to the, to the resurrection, the eschatological resurrection. So I'm just setting the groundwork for the other presentations to come. So we continue next Sunday with our, our series on the resurrection. Then we go on the 15th, which is a Wednesday, and also on the 22nd, another Wednesday. So today is the first part on the resurrection. Uh, our scripture passage is taken from Saint 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 26. It's sort of a lengthy scripture reading, but stay with me. It's very important that you follow with me as we go through these verses. I'm reading from the New International Version, the 1984 uh, translation. It reads this way. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Verse 3, for what I receive I pass on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and to the, then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some are fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and, and then to, to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has been indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, all authority and power, for he must reign until, until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26. 
The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Two points quickly as we look at 1 Corinthians 15. The necessity of his death, the necessity of his resurrection. Let us pray. Father, we pray that as we open your word to study, that your Holy Spirit will cover us and guide us into all truth. Lord, this morning we want to learn about the wonderful truth of the eschatological message of the resurrection. We pray that you bless our hearts now and make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. For I pray and say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. The necessity of his death, the necessity of his resurrection. I have two questions. Two questions. They are your questions. Both are found in the book of Job. The first, Job 9 and verse 2. How can a mortal human being be righteous before God? The second, Job 14 and verse 14. If a man dies, will he live again? Friends, the answer to these questions end the human search for God, for meaning in life, for purpose, origin, true religion, love, happiness, and even life after death. These two questions are very important, and today's talk will provide answers to these questions. So the first point, the necessity of his death. Now listen, I want us to note how Paul begins the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He tells the Corinthian believers that he is merely reminding them about the gospel he had preached, the gospel they have received, and the gospel that they have taken their stand on, and the gospel by which they are saved. So he was telling them that there is no new or improved gospel. There is but one gospel. Now understand what's happening. This was probably three or four years after Paul's initial visit to Corinth. However, by this time, the church had begun to lose its grip, its hold on the gospel. So we, we, we need to understand the cultural context of Corinth in the time of Paul. And in the time of Paul, Corinth would be the equivalent of our modern society today. There were great intellectual minds who relished philosophical ideas. They had a love for wealth, material prosperity. Their interests were taken up in the latest sophistications. Not only that, it was a city that was focused on loss and sex. Idolatry was prevalent, very much like the modern world in which we live. So it were these mitigating factors that created a cause for concern for Paul as it led persons in the church to undermine, don't play the matter of the resurrection to the point that there were some who were saying that there might be a resurrection, but not a resurrection of the body. Or others were, were, were saying, are contending for, that there will be no resurrection at all. This is what we have. Very much like the Sadducees in their belief. Paul then argues that to misconstrue, to undermine, and don't play the resurrection is to trample upon the gospel. Let me say that again. Paul is making the point that to misconstrue, to undermine, to don't play the resurrection is to trample upon the gospel. Now, Paul's theological understanding of the gospel consisted of Jesus' death and his resurrection and all the theological implications thereof. For Paul, the gospel was not one subject and the resurrection and the resurrection, another subject. No. The gospel and the resurrection were the gospel, one subject as far as Paul's theological understanding was concerned. So what does that imply about eschatology? What's the implication about eschatology? As we would have been familiar with by now, 
Eschatology is the theological study of last day events or the last things, literally translated um, from eschatos, would be the last things, such as the rapture, uh, the tribulation, the second coming, the resurrection, as we're looking on today, the new creation. These are all eschatological uh, subjects. So resurrection is then an eschatological subject. Stay with me now. The implication thereof is that eschatology is not a different branch of theology from the gospel. Let me say that again. The implication is that eschatology is not a different branch of theology from the gospel. In other words, I am saying that eschatology is the gospel in its final phase. It is the final episode of the gospel. It is the culmination of the gospel. It is the gospel, it is the gospel in ecstasy. In other words, eschatology is the end goal, the final leg of the gospel. Why was that important to say? Why was that point important to be made? It is important that as believers that we treat eschatology with the same interest and devotion and sacrifice as we do the gospel of Christ, the cross of Christ. For eschatology is also the gospel, not a different theological study altogether by itself. So Paul begins to talk about the resurrection with the death of Christ for our sins. The necessity of his death, the first point. Listen to uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. Paul says, For what I received, I, pass, I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now Paul begins this argument for, for, for the bodily resurrection of Christ and the consequently bodily resurrection of believers by first talking about the reason for Christ's death. Now, this is a good place to start. Wouldn't you agree? Because the ultimate prerequisite for resurrection is death. You have to die in order to be resurrected. So why did Christ have to die? The answer stares us in the face in verse 3. Christ died for our sins. So he didn't die because it was a good gesture of love. He didn't die a martyr's death. He didn't die even a mere natural death. He didn't even break the law. He didn't even break the law and died for it. He didn't die because he was an insurrectionist or a, a, a revolutionist. Jesus died someone else's death. Note how Paul says it. Christ died for our sins. So Christ died someone else's death, and that someone else is you and I. He died the death that was ours because he took all the consequence of sin upon himself. In other words, it was a representative type of death, and one for all death. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.14. It, it expresses it this way. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. One for all, therefore all died. We all died in our representative man, Jesus, on the cross over 2,000 years ago. But not only was this death cosmical it was also eternal in nature this is something that's a great mystery to the human mind someone might even ask it was it was not eternal because jesus rose three days after now when we say that jesus died an eternal death we're not talking about in terms of quantity of days but the quality of his death Jesus was eternal, God is eternal, and therefore the death on the cross was not natural, it was eternal. It was eternal separation from God. 
In this death, the ultimate cause for sin, the ultimate wrath of God against sin was poured out in full, in complete measure on Jesus on the cross. You know what that shows us, beloved? That shows us that sin is destructive. That sin is a threat to life. A threat to happiness and a threat to holiness. So we can then conclude that Jesus' death on the cross was the payment for the consequence of our sin so that the consequences of sin might be removed for all those who believe in Jesus. 1 John 3 and verse 5 puts it brilliantly. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away, note those words, take away our sins in him is no sin. This is the language of the day of atonement, the language of the scapegoat. Jesus who committed no sin took all our sins away at the cross and therefore all the consequences of sins have been removed in Jesus. Friends, forgiven sins sins that have been that would have been blotted out of the cross cannot return to condemn the believer they are forever gone praise be to god so that's why even though we are not perfect behaving children of god we are perfectly his children because of the cross because of his death on the cross even though we have zero righteousness all of christ's righteousness has been given to us even though we stand before god naturally condemned by sin by virtue of the cross we stand before god without sin with all the spiritual achievements with all the righteous achievements of jesus pinned to our chest listen to what john Christon, an early church father, described what the cross achieved. And he does so using these poignant words, and I quote, for the, Christ, for the cross destroyed the enmity of God towards men, brought about the reconciliation, made the earth heaven, associated men with angels, pulled down the citadel of death, and strung the force of the devil, extinguished the power of sin, Delivered the world from, from error, brought back truth, expelled the demons, destroyed temples, overturned altars, suppressed the sacrificial offering, implanted virtue, founded the church. The cross is the will of the Father, the glory of the Son, the rejoicing of the Spirit, the boast of Paul, for he says, God forbid that I should boast save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross, he continues, is that which is brighter than the sun, more brilliant than the sunbeam. For when the sun is darkened, then the cross shines brightly. And the sun is darkened not because it is extinguished, but because it is overpowered by the brilliancy of the cross. The cross has broken our bond. It has made the prison of death ineffectual. It is the demonstration of of the love of God, end of quote. And this takes us to the second point, the necessity of his resurrection. He died, therefore it was necessary for him to be resurrected. But should it really have mattered that Christ was resurrected? Couldn't we have had a dead savior? Paul asks that question in, in 1 Corinthians 15. What does the resurrection of Jesus afford believers? To answer these, to these questions are found in verses 12 to 19. Let me read those verses for you again. This is what Paul says. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. 
For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are, for if the, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. If Christ has been raised, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then those who, are, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Listen to verse 19 now. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. So, but, but before we go in any further, before we look at these verses, let's pause a while and define what resurrection means. What is the meaning of resurrection? The Greek word translated resurrection in English is anastasis. Anastasis. A-N-A-S-T-S-I. A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I. Anastasis. It means a rising up or a standing up again. A rising up again or a standing up again or to rise out of death. So resurrection is, in a simplistic form, means the return of life to the body that was dead. The return of life to the body that was dead. Now, resuscitation, resuscitation and near-death experiences are not resurrection experiences. They are not. Totally different. Resurrection takes place when there is an absence of life in the body. The person is, the body is dead. The person is dead. So, uh, resurrection in its eschatological context for believers means the return of life to the body never to die again. The return of life to the body never to die again. Let me, let me, let me say this here. Resurrection in the scripture is defined as the return of life to the body that was experienced by Lazarus and many other persons in the Bible, but they died again. Resurrection for the believer, eschatological resurrection is different. It means to be resurrected to eternal life, never to die again. At this resurrection, our body is transformed with no presence of the former weaknesses, such as hunger and thirst and death and aging, it is glorified and it is like the first body that Adam and Eve had, but with more grandeur, with more glory. So that's the resurrection. But please note the intent of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The intent was not to prove that Jesus was resurrected. He doesn't set out to have that argument. He's not saying, I am proving to you, I'm making a case for the resurrection of Jesus. He is rather asserting that Jesus was bodily resurrected from the dead. He's telling them that, listen believers, look at the facts. They are compelling, they are irrefutable, incontestable, and pointing in one direction, a Savior bodily resurrected from the dead with a glorified and transformed body without his former weaknesses and not subjected to death. In other words, Paul is saying that the resurrection of Jesus by itself is his own proof. But why was that important to say, Lionel? It is important that we take note of that point for a number of reasons all found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen to these points. I will summarize them in five, in five main points. Paul is saying, number one, if altogether there is no resurrection, Christ is not risen. So if the resurrection is not factual, then Christ is not risen. That's the point of verse 13. Second, He's saying, if there is no resurrection of Christ, salvation is incomplete and we are all condemned in sin and Christianity is false. That's the point of verses 14 to 17. Thirdly, if there is no resurrection of Christ, then there is no eschatological resurrection of believers. That's verse 16. Fourth point. It is the death of Jesus for our sins and his resurrection that, se that secure the eschatological resurrection of the saints. 
that, verses, that is verses 20 to 22. The fifth and final point in summary. Believers should never treat the subject of Jesus' resurrection lightly or think it can be disproved. Let me go with that again. Paul is saying that believers should never treat lightly the subject of Jesus' resurrection thinking that it can be disproved. In other words, Paul is saying eschatological resurrection is irrefutable because of the resurrection of Christ. And that's the point of verse 20. So Paul is asserting that Christianity is a resurrection religion. In other words, if Jesus rose from the dead, and he did, all his claims and all the claims of Christianity are true, hands down. They are irrefutable and must be followed. And this is why in the book of Acts, almost every public sermon was trumpeted with the resurrection because no one could refute his veracity. So in the New Testament, the resurrection of believers is predicated on Jesus. The resurrection of Christ inaugurated, installed, and guaranteed the last day resurrection, the eschatological resurrection. Let me go with that point again. The resurrection of Christ inaugurated, installed, and guaranteed the eschatological resurrection of believers and also unbelievers. But today we're focusing on the resurrection of the believer. So in other words, we're saying Christ's resurrection makes certain the believer's eternal resurrection to life. Listen to how Paul, Peter says it in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. He says, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for us, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be re revealed in the last time. I told you before that Jesus died a representative death. The truth is, he also had a representative resurrection. <laughs> what am I saying? When Jesus rose from the grave that Sunday morning, he was resurrected for all. One was resurrected so that all might be resurrected. And therefore, all was resurrected. This is what, this is, this is, this is what the scholars call the objective the yet but not yet language of salvation in the Bible. Here's how Paul says it in verse 22. He says, for, for as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is not talking about uh, a spiritual new birth. He's talking about bodily resurrection. Listen to how uh, Colossians 3, 1 puts it and he says it clearly. You have been raised with Christ. Let me say it to you this way. When Jesus rose from the grave that Sunday morning, eschatological resurrection that belongs to the last day before the rapture took place for the believer in Jesus Christ. So it's not an if or a might or, or some doubt about whether or not we will experience resurrection we will experience resurrection because jesus rose from the grave his resurrection guarantees our resurrection at the last day and when you read uh, ephesians chapter one paul says that god has given us the holy spirit as a deposit for our Final redemption. And whenever Paul talks about final redemption, our last day redemption, he is always talking about resurrection. So in verse 20, Jesus called the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Here, according to Paul, Jesus has fulfilled the first fruit offering of the Old Testament. 
The first fruit offering was that offering that was made that showed that the great harvest is guaranteed. First fruit is like what we have when we have our mango season or our apple season or any season. We get a first crop. And that first crop guarantees, it tells, it's an indication, it's a telltale sign that there will be a greater, an abundant harvest in the future. So Jesus' resurrection secures the abundant harvest resurrection of all believers. Paul says he's a first fruit, and first means first, right? Before anything else. Question. Was Jesus truly the first person to be resurrected? No. If you know your Bible well, you, you readily answer no. We have resurrection accounts like the, uh, the son of the widow from Zarephath that was raised by Elijah. We, we know of Jairus' daughter and the one that everybody knows, Lazarus. All these individuals were resurrected before Christ. So how... And why did Paul say that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep? Now, when Paul uses the, the, the word first fruits, Paul was not referring to uh, quantity. He was referring to quality. He was not referring to the chronological order of events. He was referring to quantity. In other words, he was saying Jesus was Jesus' resurrection was first of its kind. It was a resurrection so that he would never die again. In other words, then, Jesus' resurrection is the first of all resurrections of persons who will be resurrected never to die again. The eschatological uh, resurrection of believers takes place at the rapture and, we, and brother palmer would have done well at that at the rapture and there's also the resurrection of the wicked and this takes place at christ's second coming when they are raised to life in bodily form to receive judgment for sins done in the body now Resurrection is not a New Testament phenomenon. The, that charge has been uh, made that you, don't, you cannot find resurrection in the Old Testament. That is not true. In places like Daniel chapter 12, a well-known uh, passage, uh, verses 1 to 3, we read about the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked. We can also look at Psalm 49 and verse 15 and Isaiah 26 and verse 19. So resurrection is not a New Testament. It's not a Pauline idea. It's not, a, it's not, it's not something that was, that, that was just plucked out of thin air. Resurrection is a theology that can be found in, all, in, the, in, in the entirety of Scripture. Resurrection is Jesus restoring the human person to his pre-fall glory. We're going to touch more on that in, 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 in other talks. It is returning the human person in his entirety to his pre-fall glory. In, in, in this situation, when we would have been resurrected, eschatological resurrection, we would be naked, yet clothed with a glory that is so beyond our imagination. We will live, but we'll never age. We'll eat, yet we will never be hungry. If there's anything that this pandemic has reminded us of, it is of our mortality in this life, that life is fragile, that life can end at any time without even prior notice. However, like what he did for his beloved friend, Lazarus, Jesus will do that and more for all those who believe in him. Jesus arrived at Lazarus' tomb when Lazarus was decomposed. And can I let you know that Jesus is going to arrive many years, thousands probably, years after we would have died or after believers would have died. But it was still would have been sufficient. Time doesn't matter as far as the resurrection is concerned. 
decomposition doesn't matter as far as the resurrection is concerned. All that matters is Jesus and his power to raise people from the dead. But listen to how Martha addressed Jesus uh, when he appeared uh, late. John 11, starting at verse 21. He said, Martha said, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But listen to what he says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. He said, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. But Jesus rebuts in verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. I want to say if you're listening to me and you would have lost someone uh, by COVID-19 or any other, uh, for any other reasons, I want to say if that person was a believer, your friend, your family member will rise again. If you should die as a believer in Christ, you will rise again. But then Martha counters in verse 24. Martha answered, I know, listen to her words, he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now Martha is talking about eschatological resurrection. That last day is the word um, eschatology, eschatos in the Greek. In the last day. But now listen to what Jesus says in verse 20, 25 that blows her away. Jesus said, uh, verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? For Martha and the Jewish friends, the resurrection was something that happens at the end of history, at the last day, eschatologically. Now in verses 22, verses 25 and 26, Jesus tells Martha that she is looking at and that she is in the presence of resurrection. Friends, in simple language, what, what, what most Jews and, and what Martha hoped God would do for Israel are all believers at the end of history they can experience a miniature, a foretaste in the middle of history. And they did. They did that very day. Lazarus was resurrected. Friends, we have a savior who is not waiting on eschatological resurrection. He's not waiting for that moment to come. He is resurrection. And that's the point that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 15. Jesus is resurrection and therefore he makes possible the eschatological resurrection of all believers. So they roll away the stone and Lazarus got out. They rolled away the stone so that Lazarus could come out. Jesus said, come out. And Lazarus came out. Have you ever thought about uh, the resurrection of Jesus? The Bible says that the stone, like what they did uh, at Lazarus's tomb, was also rolled away. But did you think that they rolled away the stone so that Jesus could get out? Is that your belief? That was my belief once. And then I looked at it again. Jesus, with his resurrected body, this glorified body, this perfect body, could walk through walls. We, 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 we have accounts in, in, in John and the Gospels where Jesus appeared to his disciples with the door closed. He went through the wall. So Jesus could have been resurrected even with the stone rolled against the tomb. So why was the stone rolled away for Jesus? I, I posit to you this morning that the stone was rolled away not because Jesus wanted to get out, but in order for us to go in so that we can recognize that Jesus' resurrection truly happened. The stone was rolled away not because Jesus wanted to get out, but so that he could let us in. And this resurrection of Jesus broke death in half. Death has been crushed for believers. The final text 
is Romans 4 and verse 25. He was, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Paul is making uh, a brilliant theological statement in verse 25 of Romans chapter 4. Paul is saying that there is an interlocking of eschatology, an interlocking of soteriology, the study of salvation, and Christology, the study of Christ. Last day events, last things, salvation, and Christ are all interlocked in the salvation process. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus is the finished product. It's the icing of the, on the cake, the cherry on top of the cake. It is the objective outside of us historical work of salvation. Therefore, the eschatological resurrection of believers is the salvation of the total human person. That's what it is. When we would have been resurrected, that shows that we would have been totally saved by Jesus Christ. So when Paul says that Jesus was raised to life for our justification. He's not contradicting the many statements that he would have made, like in uh, uh, Romans chapter 3, about that Jesus' death secured our justification. He's not contradicting that. He's using justification in a certain context. And that context means, like you would have, go, you would have gone to the supermarket before the lockdown, the weekend lockdown, no, no movement days. Let's say that you were in... Uh, high low or shoppers for our, our progressive or Leeds uh, family uh, supermarket or uh, one of these and there is a plain closed security you would have purchased something you went outside and then it dawned on you that you forgot an item you went back went back with your bag but there's something that the cashier would have given you that shows your bill of right, your sale of right to the items that you have in your bag. That's what we call receipt. A receipt shows that you have legally paid legal tender money for what you have. And nobody can accuse you of stealing it. That's what the resurrection of Jesus does for the believer. It is our receipt, our certificate, our bill of right to our full and total salvation at the end of time, at the resurrection. Resurrection means, last day resurrection, that Jesus has invaded, disrupted the order of things by bringing eternal life in the face of eternal death. Salvation in the midst of condemnation. Hope in the place of horror. Joy in the place of doom. Jesus, Jesus' resurrection on that Sunday morning ensured your eschatological resurrection. His death secured the price for sin so that we no, can no longer be condemned. And his resurrection guaranteed that we can experience the eternal consequences. His resurrection guarantees that we can experience the eternal consequences of his death. If you are here, you're watching online, you are not a believer, and you have heard the message of salvation, you want to ask Jesus into your heart, I'm willing to pray for you. And the leaders here are willing to call you up and talk with you, visit with you, so that you can understand what salvation is. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today that you have given us a foretaste of this matter of resurrection, even last day resurrection, eschatological resurrection. And Father, you have reminded us that the death of Jesus that secured the cost for sin, the payment for sin, brought Jesus to death, but he was resurrected and by consequent Jesus' resurrection guarantees our eschatological resurrection at the end of time. We can say that Jesus' resurrection is an example of the resurrection of all believers. And so, Lord, I pray for that person who is reaching out to you, who is asking for salvation, that your Holy Spirit will visit, 
them. We'll comfort them and let them know that they would have experienced salvation and their resurrection is guaranteed at the end of time. Father, we thank you for being with us and we thank you for your word of hope and peace. For we pray and say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.